Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. I'm divorcing you. That's it. How much longer can I bear this? Upon hearing these cruel words, Sandy covered her ears with her palms and buried herself in her prayer book, saying to herself, Virgin Mary, have mercy, enlighten his sinful mind. He doesn't know what he's doing. I beg you, Mother of God. Throw away this rubbish. Matthew snatched the tattered book from her hands and angrily threw it away. The pages scattered like dry leaves, detached from the worn-out cover, and sprinkled the carpet in the living room, while Sandy wailed as if in pain. Lord, what are you doing? Calm down, Matthew, I'm asking you. You've exhausted me with your prayers, your constant pleas, good deeds, and silly religious whims, the husband yelled at the woman. Have you really lost all your senses to the extent that you can't see anything around you except your deceitful religion? None of it helps you, do you understand that? It's been years since the diagnosis was made, and you still keep going to your priests. I told you we should have done artificial insemination before it was too late. But now it's all over, the train has left. Your artificial insemination is an abomination against God, Sandy pressed her lips together. Can you really make a baby in a test tube? Lowering the holy sacrament of the descent of the soul of God to such a level. Well, now I'll show you the descent of a soul, Matthew said with undisguised malice, approaching his wife closely. I'll show you now. What are you doing, Matthew? Sandy exclaimed in fear, paling. Don't touch me. I'll scream. Shout all you want, go ahead. The husband persisted. Grabbing his spouse's hand, he forcefully pulled her towards him and dragged her down the corridor into a distant room, disregarding her screams. Then, not loosening his iron grip, he unlocked the door, pushed Sandy into the doorway, and slammed the lock shut, turning the latch. Sit here, you fool. I can't stand to see you anymore. I'll open it when the divorce papers arrive, he shouted at her through the door. Sandy, lying on the floor, embraced her head with her hands and cried like a beaten dog, whimpering and sobbing pitifully, mixing her lamentations with prayers. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us sinners. Oh, how it hurts, he probably broke my hand, the scoundrel. Save and have mercy on him, Lord, for he knows not what he does. Take me to yourself quickly, I beg you, I have no strength left to endure this life. Blessed are the believers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I believe, I believe, Lord. The woman even rose from her contorted position, and a fanatical gleam appeared in her eyes. I believe. Yes, all the evil he has inflicted upon me and others will return to him a hundredfold. Let it be according to your will, Lord. She continued to mutter something, bowing, crossing herself, and sobbing, pounding her forehead against the door frame. Then she fell silent, calmed down, and somehow made her way to the sofa in the corner of the room, climbed onto it, and fell asleep. Matthew and Sandy had been married for quite a long time, over a decade. In the early years of their marriage, a tragedy occurred in the family. Their firstborn, a beautiful boy, died barely reaching a year old due to complications from a viral infection. Even his own relatives couldn't do anything to save him. And in this family, everyone was in the medical field. Neither Matthew, a young resident doctor at the time, nor his father, a renowned cardiac surgeon, nor his uncle, also a brilliant doctor, could help. And Sandy, the young beauty he married out of great love, almost lost her own life after this tragedy. She fell into a severe nervous fever, and for many months, she was treated by neurologists, psychologists, and cardiologists. But she was never the same again. The fragile, brief happiness they had experienced together had long evaporated, dissolving into a white cloud in the indifferent sky above their little son's grave. It was then, at their child's funeral, that Sandy descended into true frenzy, tearing her clothes, shrieking, and uttering horrifying curses into the pure blue sky. She screamed so loudly that a priest came from the church to the cemetery, where the little body was being mourned, and seeing the torment of the young mother who had lost her precious child, he said to Matthew. You and your wife need to turn to faith. 
It is not right to speak such terrible words to her, especially in a place like this. Matthew just frowned in annoyance at him and waved his hand, telling him to go his own way, as no one was asking him. But Sandy's agitated mother approached the priest and talked to him for a long time, crossing herself and crying. Afterwards, when Sandy was discharged from the hospital, her mother took her to the church, and it all began. Slowly but surely, the young woman immersed herself in religion. She started following all the canons and prescriptions, praying a hundred times a day, fasting, attending various services, receiving communion, confessing, and doing many other things there. Matthew didn't pay much attention, she tried to involve him in her beliefs, but he resisted. However, Sandy's faith didn't help her. After their first child, they never had any more children. She went on pilgrimages to holy places, monasteries, and miraculous temples several times, seeking the healing power of relics and myrrh streaming icons, but there was no result. Matthew insisted on conventional medical treatment, and reluctantly, Sandy agreed. But even that didn't work out. Diseases seemed to crop up one after another, like mushrooms after the rain. Sandy became completely different both internally and externally. She gained weight and became moody, even stopped taking care of herself. She started wearing dark robes and headscarves all the time, concealing her hair. Matthew no longer recognized his young, beautiful wife. She had become someone entirely different, distant from him. Moreover, she had become disheartened, desperate, and frankly unintelligent. He began to feel ashamed of her. He no longer invited friends over to their house or to important events where everyone came with their wives. He always went alone, and he even started paying attention to other women. What can you do? Nature takes its course. I'm not a monk, nor would, really, he complained to his closest friend, also a doctor, with whom they had been friends since their first year of medical school. But divorce her, his friend advised him, and get married again. Aren't there plenty of beautiful girls around? I should, Matthew sighed. But you know, I feel sorry for her, Norwood, I feel sorry. I keep thinking, I used to love her so much. Oh. Why did everything turn out this way? Is it fair, huh? I'm asking you. Is it fair that such a beautiful young woman suddenly turned into a terrible, insane woman, like a devil? Unfair. Norwood agreed, pouring another drink. You have duty tomorrow, Matthew. Damn it, to hell with it, Matthew waved him off. Morning is still far away. No, it's all right. Norwood stood up and put the bottle back in the fridge. You're a surgeon, Matthew. A good surgeon, you could say it's a gift from God. Oh, don't start about me again, Matthew got annoyed. Well, fine, fine. Let's just say you're a brilliant surgeon, Norwood pacified him. But a surgeon needs to have a steady hand, right? Isn't that what we were taught? Isn't it true? It's true. Matthew sighed and stood up too. I'm going to bed. Over the years of such family life, Matthew had had many women, mostly at work. Where else could he meet women when he was at the clinic 24-7? He rarely came home even less frequently than on business trips. But he also had affairs at conferences and symposiums with fellow doctors, specialists who had taken a break from their routine for a couple of days. They passed through his life without leaving a noticeable trace in his heart or soul. He often didn't even remember their faces, let alone their names. Friends and family wondered why he hadn't left his wife yet, as their hopelessly broken relationship had long been no secret to anyone. Matthew himself couldn't say anything about it. Yes, he was angry at Sandy, very angry. Sometimes he was ready to hit her with something, but occasionally, very rarely, when he came home late, he would find her already asleep. In her sleep, her face would smooth out, the perpetually worried expression would disappear, and there would be no trace of her melancholic sunken eyes. And then, as he looked at his wife, he would once again see in her the young beauty Sandy, whom he had been so deeply in love with many years ago, now irretrievably lost. In that distant spring, he was not yet a doctor, not yet a surgeon. He was just an ordinary guy who had recently returned from the army. 
life was vibrant all around, and Matthew, longing for the company of women during his military service, was ready to chase after the first skirt he came across. The weather outside was simply magnificent. The sky was clear and blue, leaves were unfurling everywhere, and the scent of blooming gardens was so intoxicating that it made his head spin. Matthew walked briskly along the narrow street in the residential area, next to the store. He had come to this part of town to visit a schoolmate and now intended to grab some alcohol for the meeting. His mood was soaring, and his internal clock seemed to have stopped at 5 minutes to 12 on the train ride home, and it had remained frozen at that wonderful moment ever since. To him, it felt like he had the world at his feet, with nothing impossible, and only joy lay ahead. So when he saw three guys surrounding a girl with a small dog on the other side of the street, their intentions clearly not the friendliest, without hesitation, within two seconds, he crossed the narrow road and, like a tiger, leaped out from behind the bushes right into the midst of the unfolding events. Hey, guys. How about you go on your way, he calmly and lazily said to this unruly trio. They stared at the unfamiliar stranger in a mixture of surprise and mockery. Did you hear that, right, one of them said to another, with a fake grin. The newcomer demands that we go on our way. How about that? And we're going on our way, Wright replied, pretending to be sensible. We're locals, but where are you from, dear sir? In a grandma-like manner, contorting his face, he pointed his finger straight at Matthew's chest. It was quite a forceful jab, and Matthew immediately assessed the potential strength of his opponent. But he wasn't scared at all, on the contrary, he smirked in anticipation of a good brawl. His hands had been itching for the past few days, eager to give someone a good punch. The long self-restraint was taking its toll. During his military service, there had been countless times when he had desperately wanted to strike some people, but he couldn't. And now, here it was. No one was getting in his way. I'm a local, he smiled, crossing his arms over his chest. We live in the same town. Oh, so you're not scared, they laughed. Or maybe you're just dumb. You've grown up, but still don't know the local rules. I don't care about your rules, Matthew sneered disdainfully. I'm telling you, back off from the girl, and that's the only rule that matters. The frightened girl, very young looking, stood between them, trembling like a delicate twig in the wind, quickly shifting her brown eyes from one opposing side to the other. The curly puppy curled up by his feet and whimpered plaintively. Meanwhile, twilight had already set in on the street, and the few passers-by at this hour hurried home, preferring to avoid the impending conflict. Now we'll show you our rule, Wright menacingly grinned, and instantly, transitioning from words to action, he swung sharply and suddenly to punch the uninvited defender in the jaw. But Matthew reacted instantly, swiftly ducking, and the opponent's blow landed in the air. The guy even staggered, propelled forward by his own momentum, and growled with anger. Behind him, the second one was about to smash Matthew's head with a large stone, and the third was approaching. However, their opponent turned out to be no ordinary person. He leaped and dodged them like a mongoose evading lightning fast strikes from venomous cobras, seizing the moment to deliver powerful and quite sensitive blows himself. Matthew was a trained fighter, having practiced various Eastern martial arts for several years, and his military service had not been in vain. However, the odds were clearly against him. Even with this situation, it's uncertain how the whole fight would have ended if not for a passing police car. The enforcers of order managed to apprehend Matthew and the other two, while the fourth one fled in an unknown direction. Afterward, they did find him and included him with the others. They served the prescribed term in isolation for hooliganism and disturbing public peace, and then they were sent to corrective labor. Fortunately, nothing serious happened, thank God, and all the defendants got off very lightly. Matthew was released the next day after sorting out who was right and who was wrong. The girl's testimony, not even recorded as a victim but as a witness since she didn't have a scratch on her, was included in the protocol and attached to the case. Come on, miss, we'll take you home, the patrol officers told her after all the official procedures. But what about him? Sandy nodded tearfully towards the corridor where they took her defender. He saved me, please let him go. Our superiors will come tomorrow, they'll look into everything thoroughly, read your statements, and release him, 
The smiling sergeant assured her. Then you can see each other. Does he have to spend the whole night here? Sandy was horrified. It's all right, he'll sleep better afterwards, the policeman chuckled. Don't worry, miss, everything will be fine with your night. It's clean and quiet here. But he's not guilty of anything. Why keep him here, the girl persisted. He protected me from them and Finn too. Upon hearing his name, the little dog lifted its bearded snout and wagged its tail in a friendly manner. Go home with Finn, the duty officer urged her. And tomorrow, you'll see your knight. He's not my knight at all, Sandy said sadly. I've never seen him in my life. And after a brief silence, she asked in a different tone, what time will they release him tomorrow? I can't say for sure, the policeman squinted. Probably closer to noon if he's really innocent. Of course, you'll see, I'll come in the morning, I'll wait until he's released, Sandy promised as she left. I have to thank him. I wish a girl like her would thank me, I wouldn't refuse, they laughed in the police station after she left. Oh well, it's not meant for us. That's how it always goes, the police arrive, fix the mess, but all the glory and girl's gratitude go to those hooligans. Right, Simmons? The duty laughter coming from the smoking room could be heard even by Matthew, who was lying stretched out on the hard official bunk, covered with a coarse mesh, in the cell together with his recent adversaries, smiling contentedly. He also intended to see that attractive girl with cherry eyes once again. She did come the next day and waited until he was released. Thank you for standing up for me, Sandy smiled shyly. My parents really want to meet you and express their gratitude. Usually, you meet the parents after at least the first date, Matthew laughed cheerfully. But I don't mind. Let's consider yesterday's incident as our first date. Sandy blushed, then laughed too, understanding how her words could be interpreted. Of course, from that very day, they started dating. They had it all, dates, moonlit walks, meeting each other's parents, and it all culminated, as was customary in those years, with a grand and joyous wedding. But fate apparently had other plans for them, despite the wishes of numerous guests. Now, reminiscing about all this, Matthew sighed in disappointment, and as for Sandy, well, only a psychiatrist could say what was happening in her mind. Actually, he did say so a couple of years ago when Matthew, exhausted by his wife's divine intentions, finally took her to a specialist recommended by mutual acquaintances, who were also doctors like himself. Well, my friend, I can tell you, the psychiatrist looked at him with regret. Destructive syndrome, depression, signs of progressive schizophrenia. You are, of course, not an expert in this field, but... I understand, Matthew nodded, trying to maintain his composure. The chances are slim, not just slim, the doctor shook his head. There are none, to be honest. I can only prescribe maintenance therapy, which I will do now. Here's the prescription. She must take these medications for life, otherwise, the condition will worsen. Right now, she is harming herself, but soon it could extend to others. Matthew understood very well what the doctor meant. Sandy had been engaging in such things for a long time, scratching her chest until it bled, whipping herself with a belt on her back, lying for hours on the cold floor, refusing food, and uttering incomprehensible cries. She called it taming the flesh. Moreover, she constantly talked to some entities visible only to her, sometimes with angels, sometimes with demons, and often, upon seeing something horrible in the void, she would rush towards the windows with terrifying screams, intending to jump out from the eighth floor, no less. Seeing it for the first time, Matthew went cold all over and called a professional to install sturdy bars on all the windows the very next day. Today, Matthew was ashamed of his actions. He had locked Sandy in the room, rushed out of the house like a bullet, and headed to work as usual. It was the only place where he felt comfortable. Here, he was respected, could fulfill himself and here awaited him obedient residents trembling in fear of the authoritative surgeon, inexperienced young interns, and a multitude of women, young or not, infatuated with him. How many had passed through his hands and his bed? He had lost count. There were even two regular partners. One was a colleague from gynecological surgery, the luxurious 30-year-old brunette, Miss Bryant, 
whom he always felt a little disappointed by. She bore a striking resemblance to his Sandy. The same type. Tall, statuesque, with magnificent curves, dark silky hair cascading down, plump sensual lips, and a velvety gaze of dark brown eyes. Oh, if only it weren't for this misfortune, his Sandy would look the same now. And the other, a complete opposite in everything, was Valerie. A petite, delicate blonde, the playful and spirited nurse Demi from Trauma Unit No. 2. When their shifts coincided, she would slyly smile at him as she passed by, shooting laughing blue eyes at him. With Demi, everything was calm, even homely. Sometimes he would tell her things, they would have tea together, order pizza, and laugh. With Valerie, it was only fiery intimacy, and she would even be jealous of each white coat under the next hospital cubby. Well, he never promised her anything, so Miss Bryant would sometimes throw a tantrum, well aware of Demi and all the other escapades of her lover, but each time she would back down. And it all started again. Matthew appealed to women, both young and older. He was charismatic and handsome, like a movie star, and with age, his strong, rugged beauty became more defined, sharper, and more attractive. Rarely could anyone withstand the piercing, slightly ironic gaze of his dark gray eyes. Few women remained indifferent to him, or rather, not quite. Those who didn't interest him were indifferent openly, at least here, in the clinic. The hospital management, of course, was well aware of the romantic inclinations of their best surgeon, but they turned a blind eye to it. Upon arriving at the hospital, Matthew, without even taking off his coat, immediately scolded the staff, anyone who happened to be in his line of fire. So, why are we sitting around here during working hours? Or is there not enough work in the hospital, he yelled at the nurses who were having tea in the kitchenette. The women, not expecting to see their superiors at such an unconventional hour, jumped up from their chairs like startled hens discovering a fox in the henhouse. Yes, we were just taking a moment, Mr. James. Oh, sorry, Mr. James, we just arrived. Everything is in order. All the patients are resting during the quiet hour. And I'll give you a quiet hour right now, the surgeon persisted. Who is the quiet hour for in the hospital? Is it for you? You should be working, not resting here. Everyone, get back to your positions. The employees scattered like leaves in the wind. However, no one was truly frightened, they all knew well the volatile nature of their boss. Most likely, he had another fight with his wife, and now he's blowing off steam, one of the employees said in a conciliatory tone to the others as they walked in a group down the long corridor toward the infirmary counter. That's it, Molly, you can go, she said, approaching the young nurse who had been sitting alone here like a little mouse while everyone else went for tea. Molly had only been working at the clinic for a short time, and she was treated as they pleased. And what's wrong with Mr. James's wife, the nurse quietly asked her colleague. Oh, everything is bad there, the colleague perked up, sensing an opportunity to gossip. Molly had only arrived yesterday from the neighboring wing of the hospital, and not only had she not yet seen the famous heartbreaker of the hospital, but she also didn't know the ins and outs of his personal life, which the entire clinic seemed to be familiar with. However, hardly anyone knew about Sandy's illness. They only knew that Mr. James had problems with his wife. By evening that same day, Molly was already sufficiently informed about her boss's escapades, and she looked at the head of the surgical department with a mixture of admiration and horror, from a distance, of course. Minor nurses were never allowed near the bright eyes of the high-ranking management. What business did they have there? Young Miss Flores got a job as a junior nurse at the hospital in the hope of making useful connections and acquaintances. The thing is, she had failed her exams at medical college, and out of principle, she didn't enroll in another college that same year. Oh, come on, mom, she reassured her single mother. If I go there now, I'll end up mixing powders and running errands at pharmacies for the rest of my life. And now what, sighed her mother. You'll miss an entire year. But I'm not going to the army, shrugged the daughter. It's not that big of a deal. At least I'll gain experience at the hospital, get to know the doctors there, and it'll be easier to apply later. Oh, I don't know, her mother lamented and hesitated, embracing her only daughter. Decide for yourself, Molly. 
this kind-hearted, compliant woman had dedicated her entire life to her illegitimate daughter. Many years ago, she came to this big city from her small hometown in search of, as they say, happiness. Just like Molly now, she tried to enroll in college but was failed in the math exam by a strict professor due to some silly mistake. Riley, sobbing, went to work at a wool factory, and going back home to cows and endless drinking sessions with her father was something she dreaded. Time passed, and Riley slowly settled in the city. In the apartment with other workers from the wool factory, eight people crowded into one apartment, the shower constantly broke, and the electric stove didn't work well in the kitchen. But all these domestic difficulties didn't frighten Riley, she had seen worse. So what if there was a cue for the bathroom? She would wake up earlier than the others and manage everything, take a shower, calmly drink tea. At home, they would wake up at 3.30 in the winter and 3 o'clock in the summer. She still felt sick from the smell of manure. No, it was better in the city, finish your shift and be free like a bird. If you wanted to go to the movies, go ahead, if you wanted to stroll in the park until dawn, go for it. Riley would enjoy her newfound freedom, and in her letters home, she would write that everything was going great, she got accepted to college, and she was studying. And to you, I bow and wish you good health, and that's it. She never returned to her hometown. Her mother had long since passed away, and she didn't want to see her father and his farming cows ever again. Over time, Riley changed her mind about going to college. Why bother? She was doing well at work. After 2.5 years, she was promoted to the senior shift, and then they sent her for further education in her field without interrupting her work. After four years, Riley became the supervisor of the department, and the organization provided her with a small but separate apartment. True, there was no kitchen, it was in the common area, but she had her own bathroom with a bathtub and no neighbors. So, Riley would come home from her shift, close the door, and feel great. She was her own mistress. After a year of such wonderful independent life, Riley gave birth to a daughter. So what if she had a daughter? What's the problem? If something like that happened in the city, they would have torn her apart and labeled her a whore for the rest of her life. But here, nobody cared. At work, everyone took the news normally, as a matter of course. They gave her maternity leave without saying a single word of insult. Colleagues whispered, of course, in the corners, but no one dared say anything bad in front of their boss. And her colleagues, those of equal status, even congratulated her, they gave her a playpen, rattles, and a bouquet of flowers. That's the city for you, that's civilization. Riley appeared outwardly happy and content, and she grew to love her tiny daughter very much. As for who the father was and why she couldn't live with him, nobody knew anything about it. She didn't breathe a word about who fathered her daughter to anyone at work. So, the workers talked about it behind her back for a bit and then forgot. After all, who knew what anyone else had going on in their lives? Being a single mother even turned out to be quite convenient. After a few years, she and Molly managed to get a two-bedroom apartment with their own kitchen, a spacious balcony, and a large room. Riley promptly arranged her own bedroom and allocated the big, bright room for her daughter's studies without any disturbances. She bought her a piano and enrolled her in a music school, ensuring that everything was no worse than for others. They lived like that, and everything was normal, even good. They went on vacations together more than once using travel vouchers, and Molly went to camp from the factory. Things went well and smoothly at work too, and just before her daughter's adulthood, Riley was promoted. She was appointed as the head of production. And Molly grew up to be such a beauty, such a clever girl. She graduated from music school with honors, although she didn't pursue further education in music. Well, it happens. But it was good for her overall development. She enrolled in a young chemist's club, where she calculated formulas and mixed powders in test tubes. But when the practical training started in the final years of school, she chose nursing courses, which Riley never expected. Molly, being a doctor is such a difficult job, she told her daughter. And how do you know, her daughter reasonably objected. You've never worked as a doctor, and we don't have any doctor friends. Yes, everyone knows. Riley shrugged. 
they study for a long time, work nights in hospitals, and even practice in the morgue. It's horrifying. But I like it, Molly firmly replied. I want to work as a children's doctor, a pediatrician. Well, sighed Riley, it's your life, and it's up to you to decide. However, Molly failed her exam. What can you do? I told her that the exam was difficult. She should have chosen something easier. But that stubborn girl insisted. No, she said, she would go for it. So now she works as a nurse, struggling and staying awake all night on duty. Still, Riley secretly felt proud of her daughter. Molly didn't back down from her dream, she didn't compromise. Let her do as she knows best. Apparently, that's her destiny. As a teenager, Molly started asking her mother more and more about her father, a natural curiosity. Riley had long been prepared for such questions and had already crafted a beautiful legend, saying that her beloved died suddenly before they could get married. And what did dad die from, the 13-year-old Molly asked sadly. From an infectious disease, Riley sighed, replying. He was a doctor who saved sick children, and one day he got infected himself. When I grow up, I'll become a doctor too, Molly said seriously, in memory of dad. Of course, of course, her mother stroked her dark chestnut hair and smiled. Of course, you will. That's how it all turned out, a naive childhood conviction. Apparently, she herself, so to speak, instilled her daughter with her future profession. Dad was a doctor, indeed. Riley chuckled and shook her head, recalling her failed love affair. Well, she never told anyone who Molly's real father was, not her two closest friends, nor the neighbor from the stairwell, with whom she had become close over the years. There was no one else in her life except her daughter. Riley had no interest in her own father's fate, perhaps he had drunk himself to death in his own town. She had no desire to go and check, but she was at peace for her daughter. After all, she knew that Molly was provided for in case of emergencies. Molly's real father, although not listed on the birth certificate and never having any contact with his daughter, still knew of her existence. He had even opened a bank account in her name and informed Riley about it. The account held a substantial amount, and the interest had accumulated over the years. Riley kept this secret about the account as her most precious possession, hiding it in the most secluded corner of their apartment along with a notebook page, on which she had written some information for her daughter, intending to reveal it only before her death. Adult Molly no longer asked about her father. She realized that such conversations were unpleasant for her mother, or maybe she didn't want to accidentally hear some horrible story, like the ones they write in tabloid newspapers. In short, she was content as things were. Living with her mother was wonderful, and they didn't need a father. Besides, a strange thought sometimes crossed her mind, maybe her father really was a doctor. Where did this desire to go into medicine come from? But Molly didn't delve deeper into this question. She was 19, life was good, and she didn't know how to dwell on sadness for long. It was okay, if she didn't get into medical school on the first try, she would try again later. She was still young. Energetic Molly quickly earned herself a reputation at the clinic. And when the permanent operating room nurse went on maternity leave, the senior nurse assigned Molly to the position, causing a rift and quiet dissatisfaction among the staff. How can you understand this? Miss Green said. She was one of the old workers at the hospital. I've been working day and night just to get into the operating room, and this young girl comes in and gets assigned there right away. Rebecca has gone mad, I tell you. But nobody dared say anything to Rebecca's face, specifically to Mrs. Griffin, the senior nurse at the hospital. She had a stern character and dealt harshly with critics. Everyone remembered well how Miss Ramirez, sharp-tongued and finicky, ended up when she tried to argue with Rebecca. She was swiftly fired, without even having a chance to say a word. Rebecca had a close relationship with Mr. James, and the girls, in principle, suspected the reason for such close collaboration, although by now their relationship had faded away. Nevertheless, they managed to maintain a friendly rapport and often drank tea or something stronger together, discussing their own matters and issues unknown to ordinary mortals. Rebecca didn't treat the new girl, who was assigned to the operating room not for her good looks, with any special kindness. 
All right then, she said to Molly in an icy tone. Don't think, sweetheart, that you're anything special and that's why you've been so lucky. I see that you're hardworking and alert, not to mention tidy. I appreciate that, which is why I'm putting you on a probationary period, understand? This probationary period will last for three months. During that time, you'll either prove yourself or you'll be kicked out not only from the operating room but from the clinic altogether. I will personally ensure that. Is that clear? Yes, Molly replied politely but firmly and confidently, looking Mrs. Griffin directly in the eyes. When do I start? From the next shift. Rebecca couldn't help but smile with the corners of her lips. She was impressed by Molly's calm and businesslike tone. No flattery, no fear. That's exactly the kind of employee they needed in the operating room, or else they'd end up with nothing but trouble. Some would faint at the sight of bloody tampons that sometimes cluttered the operating room, others would poorly clean it, and some would forget to sterilize everything with an antiseptic solution as required. And one girl had the audacity to show up in a synthetic robe, so short that it barely covered her underwear. They were planning to seduce Mr. James with her charms. Oh, that poor fool. You idiot, Rebecca scolded her, dragging her out of the operating room by the ear. Not only are you flaunting your bare backside in front of the surgeons, but you also had the audacity to come here in synthetics. Have you even read the rules thoroughly? Yes, yes, the girl sobbed, smearing mascara across her cheeks. And what does it say about this topic? Rebecca continued to berate her, poking her face with a laminated sheet. Here, read it out loud from here. The clothing must be made exclusively of cotton fabric, the girl stammered in horror. You see, you idiot, you should read all the way to the end, the supervisor scolded her again. And now, immediately go, gather your belongings, and never set foot in this place again. Get out. Rebecca shouted at the top of her lungs, realizing that the message hadn't quite sunk in. Get out of my hospital, you damn prostitute. And the sobbing nurse ran away. Oh, it was difficult to find good staff for the operating room. One went on maternity leave and the other should have retired two years ago. Where on earth could they find good nurses? They were all a bunch of clowns. Rebecca sincerely hoped that this new one, quick-witted and resourceful, would live up to her expectations. In the end, those expectations were met. Molly proved herself not just good but excellent. She was never reprimanded for anything and performed her job perfectly. She even rectified others' mistakes at times, taking the initiative and without any hint of arrogance. Let's say, one day Mrs. Campbell forgot her instruments in the Cydex solution after a surgery. She got distracted by something and simply left the operating room, leaving the instruments behind in the fifth operating room. Luckily, Molly happened to go there, perhaps needing some glassware or realizing they were running out of towels. She took them out herself, washed them, sterilized, and dried them. Only after finishing all the work did she go to the rest area, sat down, and started reading a book. What are you reading, dear? Rebecca asked, entering the room for a cup of tea, and without waiting for an answer, she immediately turned the cover with her hand, expecting to see some cheap detective novel. Foundations of General Medical Genetics, Molly read from the frontispiece, raising her eyebrows in surprise. Why do you ask? Hmm. Rebecca only uttered and didn't say anything more. Well, that's the highest praise you'll ever get from her, the girls burst into laughter when the door closed behind the supervisor. You won't get any more approval than that. Indeed, Rebecca hadn't been mistaken about the newcomer and was now satisfied with her choice. When the clinic received huge boxes of new instruments, Rebecca freed someone from their regular duties for two days and that someone was Molly, of course. Miss Flores, come here. Tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, you will prepare the new instruments for use. Read the instructions carefully so that everything shines by the day after tomorrow, and there is no trace of grease anywhere. Clear? Of course, Mrs. Griffin, Molly calmly and firmly replied, as always. Now go. Rebecca smiled slightly and waved her hand approvingly. Go, get to work. They needed to check 12 large boxes of surgical instruments within these two days. It was not an easy task. 
Remove each instrument from its original packaging, carefully arrange them by category, inspect them closely for any factory defects, check their complexity according to the instructions, read the disassembly and assembly rules, and then proceed to cleaning. Wipe off the factory grease with a clean cloth, disassemble them into parts, and wipe each part separately. Then, place them in a special cleaning solution and wipe them again. Repeat this process two or three times until all the factory grease is completely removed. After that, boil them, wipe them again, and only then use the sterilizer. In short, there was a lot of work to be done. Molly quickly adapted. She turned on a radio play on her portable cassette player, her mother was fond of them and had introduced Molly to them. She had numerous cassettes with different plays. Molly loved listening to them while doing some monotonous work. She immersed herself completely in dismantling and cleaning the shiny new forceps, scalpels, surgical scissors, saws, and clamps. She was so engrossed and lost in her thoughts that she didn't notice the door crack open and a tall man in a surgical cap and blue uniform entered the room. It seemed as if he didn't even notice her sitting at the table near the large window. He spoke on the phone with a distant and sad tone, saying, Yes, yes, I understand. I just finished the surgery. I'll come, of course. I'm leaving right now. Molly hurriedly turned off the cassette player, but the surgeon still didn't look in her direction. Finishing the call, he put the phone in his pocket, leaned against the wall, and let out a forceful sigh, followed by pounding his fist on the smooth painted surface. Molly screamed and jumped up from her seat. The scalpel she was wiping clattered onto the tiled floor. The man slowly turned at the sound and met her gaze. His eyes were dark gray, gloomy, expressing concern and pain. Molly had never seen so much pain in her entire life. What's wrong with you, she quietly uttered, unintentionally. Of course, she already recognized the head of the hospital in this endlessly exhausted and troubled man. Nothing. I apologize for the disturbance, he replied sharply, raising his head proudly. It's just a difficult surgery. Everything is fine. Carry on, and he left, carefully closing the door behind him. Seven calls had come to his cell phone during the operation. Naturally, he had turned off the sound, leaving only the vibration, and he had placed this new heavy contraption in a far corner before the surgeries, so that nothing and no one would distract him from his work. But today, as if sensing something was wrong, restlessness burned and weighed heavily on him. And when the device in the drawer of the cabinet vibrated in the adjacent room, Matthew heard that distant sound through all the partitions and barriers. It felt like it lasted an eternity. He continued to cut and clean, amputate and suture, while the cursed phone kept ringing and ringing. What has happened to them? Matthew wondered, referring to his wife and the newly hired caretaker beneath them. Recently, Sandy's condition deteriorated significantly. She became confused in reality, stopped responding coherently to questions, and spoke nonsense. Oh, I've completely exhausted him. Suddenly, she started mistaking her husband for their son, Leo, who, in her imaginary world, had grown up and enrolled in medical school. Leo, is that you, my dear? Oh, how glad mama is that you've finally returned. Come on, eat properly, because I know you don't even have time to eat properly in the hospital, everything is rushed, everything is fast. And papa has been working his whole life, and now you too. I'll go crazy with all of you, I swear. She chirped happily near Matthew, trying to take off his jacket and kiss him on the forehead. Sandy, stop it. Matthew pleaded wearily. It's me, Matthew. There's no Leo here. Ignoring his words completely, his wife continued speaking. Oh, my darling, how you've grown. Mama can't reach you anymore, my beloved son. Come on, lean down so I can hug you. For God's sake. Matthew couldn't take it anymore. Go away. He dodged his deranged wife's persistent advances and left for his office, slamming the door behind him. Leo, why are you being like this to mama? Sandy immediately burst into tears, sitting down by the door. Mama loves you so much. Mama has no one else but you. Open up, my dear. Please, open the door for mama. 
Matthew, separated from these lamentations only by a thin partition, covered his ears with his hands and wearily leaned back in his chair, but it didn't help. His wife's crying grew louder and louder, begging and demanding her little boy to let her in, and then she began banging on the door. Matthew stood up from his chair and was about to leave to forcibly remove his insane fiancé to another room, as usual, but then the phone on his desk started ringing. Matthew looked at the caller ID, let out a deep sigh, counted to three, and answered the phone. Yes, Mr. Patterson. Hello? Oh, Matthew, my dear, hello. Mr. Patterson's rich baritone seemed to emerge from the phone cord, resonating throughout the office. How are you all? How's Sandy? Your mother and I are planning to visit you this weekend. You won't be on duty, will you? Sandy needs your company. Sandy needs to be in a psychiatric hospital, Matthew couldn't hold back and, pointing the phone toward the door, yelled, listen now, finally, do you understand that I've been trying to tell you this for a long time? He was practically shouting into the phone at his father-in-law. I can't take it anymore. She needs qualified help in a specialized facility. Is it really that hard to understand? Yes, yes, come on Saturday and take care of her yourselves, or even better, take her to your place for a week. It's your choice. Let's see what you'll say then, Mr. Patterson. Now, Matthew, calm down immediately, the man on the other end of the line murmured. You know perfectly well that Sandy won't go to any clinic. We certainly don't need such a stain on the family's reputation. No, no. I said, under no circumstances. Oh, I see. Well then, come to her on Saturday or even Friday, whenever you please, Matthew yelled in anger. Just don't expect to find me here. My feet will never set foot in this madhouse again. Just try it, his father-in-law replied weightily, threateningly. I hope you haven't forgotten what binds us. You'll be out of a job and won't be able to find one anywhere else. Yeah, go to hell. Matthew forcefully threw the phone against the wall. The plastic casing cracked, and the microphone fell out, still emanating menacing notes. He then yanked the cord out of the socket with force and slammed the phone apparatus onto the floor. Sandy fell silent behind the door, frightened by the sounds. Her husband collapsed heavily onto the carpet in his office, covering his head with his hands, howling like a hungry, abandoned dog. After enduring this dreadful night somehow, Matthew got ready in the morning, shaved, fed the calmed down Sandy, and, leaving her locked in the room, left the apartment. However, he didn't head to work as usual but went to a domestic staff recruitment agency. We understand your requirements, a friendly middle-aged woman nodded after listening to his disjointed explanations. Here's our price list. The workers will come in shifts, every other day. Pay for our services through the cashier. Don't give money directly to the employees. Trust me, it quickly corrupts them. Thus, after a couple of days, Matthew finally breathed a little easier. Despite the objections of his wife's parents, who were very reluctant to let her condition become known to a wide circle of people, he brought a stranger into the house, as his mother-in-law had put it on the phone. You'll ruin Mr. Patterson's reputation, she said. Just think, Matthew, you'll ruin all of us. Well, otherwise, Sandy will ruin herself, he said on the phone. She'll turn on the gas while I'm not home, or jump out the window, or something else. Anything can come to her mind. It's a diagnosis, Mrs. Patterson, do you understand? A diagnosis. Period. And I didn't sign up to be a caregiver for a crazy person, forgive me. I'm a surgeon. I need to work. I have surgeries, I save lives, please understand. And he hung up the phone and then went and unburdened himself with Miss Bryant, and then with Demi. He finally felt better, and the family problems receded into the background for a while. Only the clinic, only work remained. They lived in a somewhat calmer routine for about four or five months since then, Matthew didn't particularly count. Silent caregivers came and went, making sure Sandy took her pills on time, feeding her, dressing her in a timely manner, and she finally started to resemble a normal person more. There were days when he saw something familiar in her, long forgotten, but then the cloud of madness would creep in again, and everything would be as it always was. 
It's incurable, you know, Norwood, incurable, he complained to his friend, sitting in his bachelor apartment. Norwood had been married three times, and all three times he was very happy, and just as happily and easily parted ways with all his wives, regardless of young children and other accompanying circumstances. I don't understand your suffering, buddy," Norwood said, releasing rings of smoke. In life and at work, Norwood was Mr. Long, also a surgeon, but specializing in orthopedics. Well, how many times have I told you, divorce her, and everything will be fine right away? Matthew just sighed, squinted, and waved his hand at Norwood. He couldn't even tell him the dead knot that bound him to his wife's family. And then, on that very day when a very complex and lengthy operation was scheduled for the morning, Sandy performed her act. An improvised act, as they called it. Mommy and Daddy came to visit their daughter and check on the conditions she was living in, to see if she was being well taken care of. Sandy greeted them happily upon seeing her parents. Oh, Mommy, Daddy, have you come to take me away from here, she exclaimed. Let's go to the circus. Daddy promised me a long time ago. That morning, she was in the guise of a little girl. Sandy, my dear, her mother said with pity and approached to hug her daughter. Mama, where's my toy? Sandy said petulantly. You promised to bring me a toy. I've been a good girl, really. The caregiver will tell you. Isn't that right, Mrs. Rogers? That's right, the caregiver smiled. Sandy is a very good girl. Oh my goodness, Mr. Patterson said with anguish, a tall and distinguished man who was still very attractive. Well, let's go, Dad, Sandy continued in a soft voice. I'll just put on a beautiful dress now, and we'll go to the circus together. Right? Unfortunately, the circus is closed today, Sandy, her father replied. We'll go another time, but right now, you need to rest. I don't want to sleep, Sandy protested. I want to go to the circus, see the clowns, the trained dogs. You promised, Daddy. Mom, please, say something to him, she whined, intending to climb into her mother's arms. Her mother moved away from her mentally ill daughter with a sorrowful expression on her face. Sandy, Daddy is right, the circus is closed today. You'll go next weekend. For now, be a good girl, lie down in your bed, and take a nap. We have to go to work, okay? No. Sandy screamed. No, no, no. You always leave and never want to take me to the circus. I'll complain to Matthew, he'll come and punish you. As usual, she jumped from one memory to another. Matthew is a doctor, a surgeon. He has lots of sharp knives. He'll cut off your lying tongues with his knives, she yelled, no longer holding back, and lunged at her parents with wide eyes and a red, strained face. The nurse tried to calm her down, hastily filling a syringe with medication, but Sandy was quicker. She grabbed a small knife from the bedside table, which the caregiver used to open ampoules, and attacked her father, intending to thrust the weapon into his throat. Stanley, be careful, his wife cried out and tried to push the enraged daughter away with a stool, but it only made things worse. Rage only gives schizophrenics additional strength. Easily pushing her mother and the stool aside, Sandy leaped like a lynx, knocked her father to the ground, and thrust her gleaming weapon into the base of his neck. Blood splattered, and the women screamed. Seeing the red liquid flowing from her father's throat, Sandy dropped the knife and helplessly crawled away, trying to hide under the bed, saying something. Sandy's a good girl. Sandy didn't want to. No, didn't want to. The ambulance arrived quickly, and Mr. Patterson, who had lost a lot of blood, was carried away on a stretcher. Fortunately, there weren't many people around the entrance in the morning, but there were enough to witness it. By the evening, the whole household was aware of what had happened, and the next day, the entire neighborhood knew. Within a week, the entire city was discussing what they had tried to keep secret for so long. The only daughter of the director of a textile factory, and in recent years, a deputy, a well-known figure in the city and a public figure, turned out to be a long-standing schizophrenic, incurably ill and dangerous to society. Why didn't they place her in a clinic before, the townspeople wondered, discussing the incident on park benches, in kitchens, and at cafe tables. 
It's obvious, they didn't want to air their dirty laundry, explained the interlocutors. Revealing such information before Mr. Patterson's election serves no purpose, it's already clear. Now, he won't have time to think about the elections. Yes, it seems they write that it's not life-threatening, he got off lightly, just lost a lot of blood. Mr. Patterson did indeed escape with minor physical injuries, but his soul was in turmoil, and his affairs were in disarray. An emergency meeting was called at the campaign headquarters, trying to suppress the scandal that had erupted. The leading candidate for the governor's seat had hidden his mentally ill daughter from the public for many years, neglecting to provide her with proper care and keeping her in ordinary apartment conditions. What if she had attacked the neighbors, who knows? How many years has she been in this condition? How has her husband, a renowned surgeon in the city, managed to handle it all this time? And what about the future governor himself, what was he thinking? Perhaps he, too, is prone to such outbursts? Who knows? In short, cunning journalists were snooping around everywhere, sniffing out and bringing to light any information related to the case, and Mr. Patterson's pre-election campaign was falling apart at the seams. The press and news broadcasts were sensationalizing the news, adding new details, both real and fabricated, from beginning to end. Mr. Patterson, being in the clinic, was spitting and throwing things at the small screen. His associates rushed around, urging him to calm down, saying that the elections were still far off, everything would settle down soon, and they would come up with something. So come up with something on the fly, the future governor said angrily, I'm paying you for it. Meanwhile, Matthew had mixed feelings. On the one hand, at the same moment he learned about what had happened from the caregiver, calling her after the surgery, the years of the unbearable burden seemed to have instantly lifted off his shoulders. He realized that it would be impossible to hide this from Sandy's parents anymore, and they would have to place the deranged girl in specialized institutions. On the other hand, there were still some circumstances that prevented him from completely breaking ties with this family. On the day when Sandy almost killed her father, Matthew simply got drunk in his office. There was no need to go home. Sandy had already been taken to the asylum. There was no need to go to his father-in-law and Norwood was on duty. Therefore, he drank a bottle of good expensive cognac in proud solitude, and then continued with champagne he found in his stash. The patients brought alcohol in an endless stream, and even considering the constant pouring, Matthew had enough alcohol in the working bar to last him two years without running out. The world around him became warmer, his soul felt lighter, and our hero felt the urge for adventure. But Miss Bryant, as luck would have it, had already gone home, and Demi, on the contrary, hadn't arrived at work yet. After pondering for a moment, Matthew headed to the infirmary where the nurses were, intending to find Rebecca there and have a little fun with her based on their past experiences. And if she happened to not be in the mood, at least he could talk to her. And indeed, he found Rebecca, but not alone, but in the company of a young, dark-eyed girl. It seemed that he had seen this doll-like, almost porcelain face somewhere before, Good evening, Mr. James, she greeted him dryly and formally. Clearly, there were outsiders present. Good evening, Matthew nodded, amiable. Why aren't you two sleeping? We're on the night shift with Molly, Rebecca patiently explained to her boss, noticing his condition. Well, Mr. James, you could use a rest right now. Molly, bring clean linens here, quickly, Rebecca ordered. Mr. James is very tired after a day in the operating room, he needs to get some proper sleep. Of course, Molly quietly replied and hurried down the corridor to fulfill the task. Have you heard? Matthew asked Rebecca, hiccuping. Yes, she shook her head sorrowfully. I sympathize greatly. Shall we go to my office? Keep me company for evening tea, he gestured towards his office with his bleary eyes, glancing at Rebecca's robust figure. Matthew. What nonsense, Rebecca gave him a stern look. I'm married, in case you forgot. So what, her interlocutor began, but she didn't let him finish. No, it's all over, Matthew, and you really need to rest. Molly will bring the linens, and I will make the bed for you. All right, Matthew agreeably complied and went back to his office. Apparently, he fell asleep there, not waiting for the bed to be prepared, lying on the leather sofa in his clothes. 
He woke up when it was already starting to dawn and went back to the infirmary to get water from the boiler since the pitcher was empty. He no longer felt like sleeping, and his heart was so calm, so good, as it hadn't been in a long time. Upon arrival, he saw that there was only one girl sitting behind the counter, the one who had been sent for the linens. And she was dozing off, her dark head resting on her folded hands like a schoolgirl. And Rebecca is probably fast asleep. She left this girl here all alone, that harpy, he thought with sudden empathy and stared at the young girl, almost still a child. Her sleeping face softened, and the chubby cheek with the closed eye, framed by fluffy dark lashes, reminded him so much of his Sandy in those days when they had just gotten married. Back then, he would wake up at dawn out of habit, having developed the routine over several years of medical practice, and he would gaze at her as she slept, turning her graceful dark head to one side. Approaching closer, Matthew gently covered the girl with a blanket, which was always kept in the infirmary for the nurses. The nurses would wrap themselves in it and doze off in the chair when the entire clinic was immersed in slumber. These few short hours before dawn were the calmest in the clinic, but also the richest in various hospital incidents. It was during this time that the terminally ill would often pass away, sudden deliveries would begin, and the condition of borderline patients would either sharply deteriorate or show signs of improvement. It was precisely at such an hour many years ago that Matthew committed an act that had weighed heavily on his conscience ever since. Suddenly awakened from a deep sleep, the young resident received a call from his father-in-law. Matthew, you urgently need to help me. What happened, the young man said, barely opening his heavy eyes. It's not a phone conversation. We're coming right now, meet us at the back entrance. And the phone call ended with a prolonged dial tone. Bewildered, angry, and sleep-deprived, Matthew put on his jacket, went out into the inner courtyard, accessible only to staff vehicles, and lit a cigarette, waiting for the arrival of his influential relative. The black Volvo stopped outside the gate, and they waved at him from the window. Peering into the car, Matthew was surprised. Lying on the back seat was a person in an expensive suit with obvious signs of gunshot wounds. There was a hole the size of a large coin on his chest, exposing a lot of blood on his white shirt. I'm afraid there's nothing you can do to help him anymore, we need to confirm the fact of death, Matthew shook his head. The person sitting next to the father-in-law on the front seat looked at him seriously and pressed his lips together. The father-in-law immediately spoke, nervously smiling. No, no. Matthew, there's no need to call anyone. We're expecting a different kind of help from you. You always have unidentified bodies in the hospital morgue, right? They bring all the found homeless, frozen bodies, and other unaccounted corpses to you. I know that. Matthew remained silent, tense, looking at his father-in-law. It began to dawn on him what exactly the man wanted to achieve. We're one family, Matthew, his father-in-law said, raising his voice with a touch of grandeur. This person, he nodded slightly towards the obvious gangster sitting next to him, needs help. Very much, you understand? Yes, Matthew nodded. Good, his father-in-law rejoiced. Let us in. You have access there. And he gestured with his head towards the hospital morgue. In short, on that barely dawning morning, they exchanged the dead man who had been shot for an unidentified one, already examined and prepared for tomorrow's crematorium. They removed his clothes, attached a tag to his leg, covered him with a sheet, and pushed him back into the refrigerator. The old guard, who happened to be in the room at that time, had gone out for a moment but returned upon seeing the familiar doctor. Another one, he asked. Yeah, they're dropping like flies today, Matthew replied. They'll process it properly in the morning. That's it. They brought him on a stretcher, made the switch, and put the unidentified homeless person back in the car. God only knows what happened to him after that. No one, except old Mr. Cox, saw or knew anything. And he probably forgot within a couple of hours. It happened sometimes that patients were brought to the morgue from the hospital in the middle of the night. Two years later, Mr. Cox also passed away, and there were no more witnesses left. Matthew never found out who that person was or what connected his actions to the gangster, nor did he particularly try to find out. Naturally, they never discussed this episode with the father-in-law again, except for one time when he tried to recall that distant incident, threatening his wife, 
when he was trying to break free from Sandy, but only for shock value. Both of them understood that they were forever bound by this strong rope, and neither of them could escape from it. Covered with a blanket, the girl sleepily murmured something, stirred, and suddenly opened her eyes, which immediately widened with horror. Oh, Mr. James. I'm sorry, for God's sake, I just. She jumped up and started panicking, expecting the boss's anger for sleeping during the night shift. It's all right, Sandy, he said affectionately. Nothing to worry about, everyone is asleep. Everything is calm. I was also sleeping, just came to get some water. I. I'm Molly, the girl stammered, flustered. Oh, well, of course, Matthew said, embarrassed like a student. Of course, Molly. I haven't fully woken up yet. Let's have some coffee to fully wake up. It's still early, you know how good it is. Without waiting for consent, he grabbed the bewildered girl's hand and dragged her along. In the office, after turning on the coffee machine, he examined his catch with a clearer head. She did resemble a young Sandy, just like Miss Bryant. Only there, the woman was over 30, and this was almost a child. How old are you? Matthew suddenly asked her and immediately smiled. Pardon me, but in your obviously tender age, this question can hardly be considered inappropriate. I want to know if our clinic violates labor legislation. Molly appreciated the boss's joke, smiled back, as if the sun had come out. 19. Sandy was also 19 when I first saw her, Matthew thought. Here, please, take it, he said, handing the girl a cup of aromatic hot beverage. Just be careful not to burn yourself. Thank you. She looked at him gratefully. You know, you're not at all like what they say about you, she finally mustered up the courage. Oh, he asked, smiling, not taking his eyes off her. And what do they say about me? Different things, she lowered her eyes bashfully and then, slyly squinting, raised them and looked in a way that almost stopped Matthew's heart. It was just like Sandy. How is that even possible? They say that you once kicked out an intern who mistreated a girl, she said, looking into his eyes curiously. That happened, he agreed with a nod. Hitting a woman is the last thing one should do. Anything can happen, but raising a hand against a woman. And immediately he felt himself blushing, remembering how he had thrown poor, sick, innocent Sandy. He even gritted his teeth in frustration and pain. What's wrong with you? Molly asked in alarm and placed the coffee cup on the table. Oh, just feeling dizzy, he reclined on the couch and turned towards the window. Let me give you a massage. She approached him and, without waiting for permission, started massaging his temples. Matthew closed his eyes and for a minute sat, relaxed, enjoying these gentle and confident movements. What strong hands she has, he thought. And how warm. Without opening his eyes, he caught hold of those hands and pulled the girl towards him. Miss Bryant and Demi were forgotten from that moment on. Matthew immersed himself completely in his new passion. Molly reminded him of a young Sandy in every way. It was as if she was Sandy herself, but more uninhibited, cheerful, and, of course, healthy. At times, he almost forgot that it wasn't Sandy in front of him, but another girl. But he no longer confused their names since the first time, as he started calling his new love, Kitten, just as he used to call his wife. Molly was head over heels in love with her boss, smitten without a trace of reason. And all the talks about him changing girlfriends like gloves didn't affect her. Of course, she had heard enough of it during her time at the clinic, but now it all seemed insignificant. Every girl, when in love, believes that she is special and that only she can give such tenderness, such feminine affection to her beloved, and that he will be with her forever. That's how Molly thought, or rather, didn't think, but felt, sensed with all her loving heart and soul. She was 200% sure that their love was real, that Matthew loved her just as much as she loved him, and no obstacles could hinder their love. And what difficulties could there be? His wife? Well, she has been in a mental institution for a long time. He will divorce her soon, and they will get married. His reputation as a womanizer? 
Well, he behaved that way with women because he was unhappy, but now he has experienced true happiness with her, and he doesn't need anyone or anything else in this life. That's what he himself said. Matthew really told her a lot of things, that she was the best, the most beautiful, the most tender, that he would move mountains and build palaces for her, that they would divorce soon and get married, and live happily ever after, practically forever. The funniest part was that he himself believed it and even introduced her to Norwood, something he had never done with any of his women before, except for Sandy. She's just like Sandy, his friend exclaimed, seeing his classmate's new girlfriend. Of course, he said this when he was alone with Matthew, not in Molly's presence. Where did you find her? Is she Sandy's younger daughter? Norwood jokingly remarked. Come on, Norwood. It's not funny, Matthew commented sternly. We met at the clinic. She started as our assistant with nursing privileges, didn't go to college. Well, well, the perfect girl for you. Are you serious about her? Norwood asked, taking another cigarette out of the pack. Matthew didn't reply, looking thoughtfully into the distance. Norwood didn't ask any further, as it was none of his business. Hadn't he seen enough girls in his lifetime? Besides, even though he didn't know the whole story, he understood perfectly well that it wouldn't be easy for Matthew to get rid of his wife. Of course, when Sandy's father found out about everything, a grand scandal erupted. He had eyes and ears everywhere, and the fact that the lovers carefully concealed their relationship at work didn't prevent him from finding out. He even came to Matthew in person, shouting in his authoritative voice, fully recovered from the accident, and demanding proper behavior. Why do you drag this girl around with you everywhere? Have you completely lost your shame? Your wife is still alive. Don't you think about her, about yourself, at least think about the family's reputation. I have elections coming up, I just managed to bury one scandal, and now this. Matthew remained silent, knowing that there wasn't much he could hide. However, he had no intention of easily giving up Molly and even considered leaving town with her. Yes, his family wouldn't allow him to divorce Sandy. The whole town was under their control. But they couldn't stop them from leaving, right? After all, this wasn't Sicily. However, when she remembered the guy in the expensive suit who was shot, an unpleasant chill ran down her spine. Who knew what serious people her father-in-law was acquainted with? Later, reflecting on the past, Molly realized that she herself had ruined everything, her relationship with Matthew, their love. If she had behaved differently, everything would be completely different now, and life would be completely different, but now it is what it is. Here's how it happened. Matthew's father-in-law, a highly respected and well-known figure in town, a deputy and, at that time, a future governor, came to the clinic supposedly on an official visit to check the state of healthcare in the region. Well, as part of the PR campaign, of course, before the elections. As usual, they went to the most appropriate wing of the clinic for such occasions, the pediatric oncology department. Later, all the newspapers boasted photos of the popular representative embracing sick children, and after having extensive conversations with both the children and the hospital administration, this important person went back to his car with bulletproof windows and said something to his entourage, who had arrived with him. Ten minutes later, they brought a young girl, a nurse's assistant, directly to his car, and they had a very serious and businesslike conversation there. What this conversation was about was unknown to the deputy's security guards, and it wasn't their business to listen to what politicians talk about with girls in their cars. But the girl herself, of course, it was Molly, jumped out of the car in tears a few minutes later, with a red face like a tomato, and ran back to the clinic. The deputy slightly opened the front window, nodded almost imperceptibly to his entourage, and two minutes later, the delegation departed. In the general surgery room of the clinic, immediately after this incident, the following dialogue took place between Molly and Mr. James. You can't imagine how he humiliated me. The things he said. Molly sat on the same couch in her lover's office, sobbing bitter tears. Calm down and tell me clearly what happened, Matthew wondered. I've already told you three times, Molly said. That deputy, candidate, or whoever he is, who came to the clinic today, it turns out he's your father-in-law? Mr. Patterson came here, Matthew was surprised. 
And I had no idea, I've been in surgeries all day. Why didn't he tell me anything? He somehow found out about us and said I shouldn't even think of getting close to his son-in-law, or else I'll not only lose my job but myself as well. Can you believe the audacity? Matthew, what did I do to him? Well, tell me, what? It's his daughter Sandy, your wife, she's the one who's sick. Which one of us is his wife? Why is he targeting me like this? Molly cried again and again. Family reputation. Matthew bitterly chuckled. For him, human lives mean nothing, let alone someone's desires and destinies. And what do we do now? Molly exclaimed in horror. We'll leave, Matthew said firmly. We'll leave here very soon. Don't worry and endure a little, okay? Okay, Molly agreed, wiping her tears. But I'm really scared, Matthew. You're strong, my kitten, he said, embracing her and holding her close. There's no need to be afraid because I'm here with you. Yes, yes, she whispered, closing her eyes in bliss. That same evening, unable to contain such intense happiness, Molly shared it with her colleague, whom she considered a close friend. After finishing their work, the girls sat down to have tea. There was no one else in the break room, and the conversation turned to guys and their relationships. Oh, Cecilia, Molly said, slyly smiling. I'm actually dating someone here. Oh really, her friend's eyes sparked with curiosity. And who is it? Oh, it's a secret, Molly blushed. But the desire to boast to her friend outweighed everything, and she whispered the coveted secret into her ear, making her promise to keep it all a secret. Wow. Cecilia stared in astonishment but quickly brought Molly back down to earth. Well, my dear, don't you know that he's already had affairs with everyone in this hospital, more than once, she said. We're serious, Molly was offended and, forgetting all caution, added, we're actually planning to leave the city. He'll divorce his sick wife and will leave here forever so that his father-in-law can't reach us anymore. With his sick wife? Cecilia was once again taken aback. Information about Sandy's illness was a forbidden topic in the clinic and only a few people were aware of her true condition. But those who knew were trustworthy and didn't spread gossip. When Molly realized she had said too much, she changed the subject of the conversation. But it was already too late, and a couple of days later, the whole clinic was discussing the chief of general surgery's new affair and his schizophrenic wife. We thought everything was fine, but it turns out it's all really bad there. Poor Mr. James. Oh, I would console him too. This became the main topic of discussion among the clinic staff. The rumors even reached senior nurse Rebecca, who happened to be one of the insiders. Wanting to inform the chief so that he wouldn't unknowingly get into even bigger trouble, she went to his office. Mr. James, listen, not on official duty, but as a friend, I have to tell you something, not particularly pleasant, she said. What is it? The chief interrupted himself from the pile of papers on his desk. Oh, yes, Rebecca, sit down, sit down. Would you like some coffee? No, thank you, Rebecca sighed. Listen, here's the thing. The whole clinic is gossiping about your relationship with the newcomer, and that would only be half the problem considering your reputation. She smirked slightly. But for some reason, everyone suddenly became aware of Sandy's illness. Matthew frowned. So, what else are they saying in the clinic, he asked in a cold tone. Rebecca shrugged but still answered. They're also saying that you and Molly are planning to leave the city. Is that true? You should listen less to what people gossip about, Matthew began to shout. Who told you such nonsense? Better ask who didn't tell me, Rebecca shook her head. If it's true, should such things be said to anyone? Do you think I'm capable of blabbing about my life plans to just anyone? Matthew asked angrily, flaring his nostrils. Not you, of course, Rebecca replied coldly. But I strongly advise you to think about who exactly could have done it. And also think whether it's worth getting involved with such a foolish woman. I understand you, Matthew said wearily. His face showed that he was extremely nervous. Understand, Matthew, I didn't come here to tell you all this out of spite, Rebecca said sympathetically. I know how much you suffered with Sandy. 
Why do you need another foolish woman? All right, enough, Matthew shouted. This is too much, Rebecca. Go and focus on your work, and I'll handle my own life. Rebecca sighed and left, gently closing the door behind her. Matthew, left alone, jumped up from the desk, grabbed a cigarette, turned on the exhaust fan, and began pacing the office, nervously pacing back and forth. Matthew. The door opened again, and Molly's lovely face appeared in the doorway. Matthew, my love. Come in quickly, Matthew hissed, jumping up and pulling the girl inside by the hand. Why did you scream like that? There are people everywhere. Don't you understand? Why are you like this? Molly frowned, rubbing her wrist. It hurts, there will be a bruise now. Sorry, Matthew muttered, turning towards the window. What's wrong with you, Matthew? Tears welled up in her eyes. I missed you, I came to see you, and you. And what about me, he turned around, narrowing his eyes unpleasantly. Maybe it was me who blabbed to the whole hospital about us, or maybe it was me who told everyone about our plans. Huh? Why are you silent now? I, Amali trembled as she spoke, I only told Cecilia. Oh, Cecilia, Matthew laughed bitterly. Well, then it's all clear. Cecilia is, of course, your best friend and closest person, and I'm just an empty space. No, Matthew, no. But why are you like this? Molly became upset. It wasn't like this at all. And how was it really, he began to shout. Wasn't it you who was crying in a panic here recently after my dear father-in-law's visit? Didn't I tell you to be more careful, huh? And now what? All our plans have fallen apart. Everyone knows everything, including the state of my wife, he yelled, no longer caring if he could be heard. What kind of women do I end up with, forgive me, Lord? One is worse than the other. Do you even have a brain? You're stupid. Oh, so I'm stupid. That's what I am to you, Molly flared up and rushed out of the office, slamming the door. He didn't even shout after her. Sitting on the floor in the restroom with red swollen eyes, Molly was discovered by the senior nurse. What are you doing here, beauty, she exclaimed, startled. Are you okay? I'm fine, Molly replied. She struggled to stand up, adjusted her uniform, and swiftly threw something into the trash bin. Just my menstrual cycle. I slipped and fell, hit my ankle, but it's all over now. Did you also cry because of your menstrual cycle? Rebecca asked, studying her face intently. Molly averted her eyes and said nothing. Rebecca waited until she exited the restroom and opened the trash bin. On top of it lay a used pregnancy test with two bright pink lines. For the past two weeks, Matthew had been intentionally ignoring her, simply passing by when he saw her in the corridor, as if she were non-existent. Molly was desperate and didn't know what to do. The person closest to her, the one she loved, had become a stranger and distant, as if nothing had ever happened between them. Could it really be this way? Why are you so upset? Molly, one of the interns, who had taken an interest in her, asked. Mind your own business, she snapped rudely. Oh, why so? I care deeply, he pretended to be saddened. If you're feeling down, there's a great way to have some fun. Huh? How about going somewhere in the evening? Why not, Molly suddenly thought, if this insensitive fool doesn't want to notice me, I should make him jealous. Sure, she replied to the intern, even forcing a strained smile. That's great, he exclaimed happily. Then I'll come find you after the shift. Okay, Molly nodded, feeling nauseous. She didn't need this foolish intern at all. May he disappear? Oh, Matthew, Matthew. What have you done to me? How can I reach you? Her innate pride prevented her from simply going and trying to make amends. Besides, she realized that she had acted poorly and foolishly by telling Cecilia about their relationship and plans. But she had to take action. After all, now they were bound to each other more tightly than ever before, and he must find out everything. But such news cannot be conveyed when you are in a fight with your beloved. Let him be jealous. Let him regret that she is not with him. 
let him come on his own, apologize for his tone and cruel words, for his indifference. Then she would tell him everything. Mr. James, may I speak with you? Rebecca came for a coffee with her supervisor, as she often did. Come in, Rebecca, Matthew sighed. How's life, young lady? I'm fine, Rebecca cautiously glanced at her boss, expecting him to say something, but he remained silent, watching the coffee machine pour the aromatic drink. Listen, Rebecca, Matthew turned around and looked serious. They say Molly is seeing the intern. Is that true? Did Valerie tell you that? It doesn't matter, said Matthew, who had recently rekindled relationships with two of his former lovers. Rumors are circulating, yes, confirmed Rebecca, but I didn't come to talk about that with you. Rumors? Matthew demanded, disregarding her last sentence. I won't lie, rumors are circulating, Rebecca shook her head. But you better talk to her yourself, Matthew. The girl is exhausted. I have nothing to talk to her about. Matthew stubbornly replied. Come on, Rebecca pleaded. I know you, and I know you're also worried. Maybe it's serious between you? Maybe something good will come out of it, something real. Do you really think so? The surgeon asked his friend, a glimmer of hope in his eyes. Yes. She nodded seriously. Yes, I do. With the best intentions, Matthew walked down the long corridor of his clinic wing, intending to find Valia. It was already past two in the morning, and at this quiet time, they could talk and make up without unnecessary witnesses. Carefully peeking into the rest area where the nurses usually dozed off, Matthew didn't see Valia there. Rebecca, looking lively, was on duty, reading a worn-out detective novel while wrapped in a warm blanket. When she saw Matthew, she smiled and nodded kindly, snuggling tighter in the blanket. He responded in the same way and continued on. Checking all the places where Molly could possibly be, he still didn't find his target. The only place left was the intern's room, where both interns and nurses sometimes gathered, although it was not particularly encouraged. Approaching the door, Matthew grabbed the handle. It turned out to be locked, and suspicious sounds were coming from inside. He forcefully pulled on the fragile handle, and the flimsy latch, unable to withstand the pressure, gave way to his strong hand. The door swung open, revealing an outrageous scene. On the couch, in an unmistakable position, was a sweet couple, his Molly and the despicable intern. Naturally, he didn't remember their surnames and names until they somehow made themselves known. Matthew, Molly cried out in despair, jumping up and desperately trying to cover herself. Matthew, wait, you've misunderstood everything. Ignoring her, he almost ran back down the corridor, but Molly ran after him, shouting at the top of her lungs, Matthew, don't leave. Please, don't leave. Hear me out, I beg you. But please, just wait. Patients started peering out of their rooms. The medical staff rushed into the hallway from all the hidden corners. Concerned Rebecca emerged from the infirmary. Halfway, Molly finally caught up with her beloved and, grabbing his sleeve, began to say something, tears streaming down her face. Matthew, forgive me, you fool. I just wanted you to be jealous. Forgive me. Go away. Matthew hissed, shaking her off as if she were an annoying fly. No, no. Molly persisted. Do you want me to kneel before you? But please, Matthew. Have you really stopped loving me completely? She actually knelt on the floor, clutching his clothes, hugging his knees. Matthew, red with shame and anger, tried to free himself from her tight embrace, but it didn't go well. Let go immediately, he scolded her. You've completely lost your shame. Matthew, Molly whimpered softly. Wait, listen. I'm pregnant. We're going to have a child, Matthew. What? He straightened up in astonishment, no longer resisting. What did you say? Yes, yes, we'll have a little baby. You've gone completely mad, he laughed suddenly, with malicious irony. What do you mean, a baby? Do you really think I'm such a fool to believe your tales, especially after what you were just doing in there? And he nodded his head towards the chief physician's office. Save your nonsense for other idiots. 
how dare you come up with such rubbish as if we had something serious between us. It's just laughable. Hear me, you're ridiculous, stupid fool. There's definitely something wrong with your head. I have hundreds of women like you. Do you hear me? Hundreds. Go tell your sniveling interns your nonsense. And even if you really got pregnant, you know what they do in such cases. The gynecology department is on the fifth floor. And finally, he freed himself from her leather claws and proudly walked into his office, donning his lab coat. The door slammed shut, and complete silence fell. The only sound that broke the silence was a quiet sob. Sitting on the bare, slippery linoleum floor, the little nurse Molly cried softly, like a beaten, abandoned puppy. Many years have passed since that day. Matthew's father-in-law successfully won the pre-election campaign and obtained the coveted governor's seat. He had done a lot of good for his region as governor and even more for himself and his business partners. Mr. Patterson remained in his position for quite a long time, as long as his health allowed. His daughter, Sandy, a former beauty and the young wife of a successful renowned surgeon, ended her days in a psychiatric clinic about three years after her husband left their hometown. He left suddenly, without warning anyone in advance about his decision. The governor was angry and promised to deal with his disobedient son-in-law, but soon he had much more pressing matters. Personal grief overshadowed that unpleasant, treacherous escape. The thing is, in his time, Mr. Patterson was an extremely amorous man and had relationships with various women. Apart from his only legitimate daughter, Sandy, he had other children as well. He was very proud of the fact that he always acted like a man in such situations, as he liked to repeat, boasting about it among his close friends. He provided all his children, as well as the women, with a comfortable living, and they lacked nothing. However, he never gave his surname to any of them, fearing unnecessary compromising scandals, except in one case when he finally had a son. A boy, I finally had a boy, he happily announced to his friends gathered in a luxurious sauna to celebrate the occasion. There you go. And proudly showed a photograph of a wrinkled red baby. Oh, a real man, the gathering responded politely. An heir, to his health. Yes, now finally there is an heir, Stanley sighed with relief. All I ever had were girls. I thought God would never give me a son, but I was mistaken. A good woman should give birth to a boy first. That's what my grandmother used to say. Well, to your wife, the men laughed and raised their glasses together. Mr. Patterson registered his son under his own name, as expected. He interacted with him provided for both the boy and his mother, and lived with them in two houses. If his wife suspected anything, she didn't show it. In the year when the useless son-in-law fled the town, the boy turned 18. He had grown quite big, so they organized a big celebration for the occasion, and everyone who knew about it congratulated the happy father with all their hearts. Three days later, the son narrowly escaped an accident on the Harley given to him by his father. He was flying recklessly on the night road, trying to avoid an oncoming car, but ended up crashing into a pole. And so it began. Hospitals, doctors, examinations. Mr. Patterson had no time or interest for his runaway son anymore, and no one else searched for Matthew, leaving him to his own fate. Jumping ahead, it should be said that the governor's son, although saved that time by the efforts of doctors and the money of his influential father, didn't live for long. A few years later, he got into another car accident, this time abroad, where he had been sent to study at an elite school. And this time it had a fatal outcome. After his death, Mr. Patterson, inconsolable, resigned and, six months later, retired, but his position was never left vacant. The old governor was quickly replaced, and he spent his remaining days at his country house with his wife, aged and forgotten by everyone. But what about Matthew? His fate turned out to be more fortunate. After leaving his hometown, he lived in the capital for a while, successfully practiced medicine, and held a prominent position in a well-known clinic. Trying to forget his past, he immersed himself in scientific work. He defended his doctoral dissertation, published in leading medical journals, and traveled extensively abroad for symposiums and medical conferences. During one such trip, he was invited to take the position of department head at a university in St. Petersburg. 
That's how Matthew permanently left the country and became a true Russian. With years passing by, even his accent faded away. He never got married, never had children, and lived as a bachelor with a fat and cheeky cat named Tom. That was his entire family. Sometimes, while conducting exams, the old professor seemed to be somewhere else, absent-mindedly peering through his glasses at another young man or audacious girl, barely listening to what they said in response. Such episodes quickly caught the attention of the students and became known as Professor Alexander's Contemplation. Mr. Ignatovich was now the name by which the former Russian surgeon, Mr. James, was called. So what were you saying? Professor Ignatovich asked the next young man sitting across from him. I didn't say anything, Professor, the young man replied with a smile. I was waiting for you to come back. Oh, really? Matthew looked into the eyes of the overly truthful student attentively and unexpectedly smiled in response. Well then, let's continue from here, shall we? This amusing incident marked the beginning of a touching friendship between the student named Leonid and the elderly Russian professor. It was soon discovered that Leonid also had American roots. My mother is American, he would tell him. My father is English and came here for an exchange program for one semester. Ah. I see, the professor repeated his favorite phrase, gazing poetically at the joyful dark-haired youth. Once upon a time, he also had a son, a cute little boy. He and Sandy named him Leo, after him. Oh, Sandy, Leo, why did everything turn out so sad? Shaking off the obsession caused by bitter memories, Professor Alexander Ignatovich returned to his lecture and began expansively expounding the intricacies of medical science to the students. But, it seemed, today was a strange day. Various extraneous thoughts kept popping into his head, and as the leaves outside the window turned yellow, the professor recalled another person. A girl with beautiful eyes, Molly, who was in love with him, a silly nurse who was pregnant with his child. Right before his departure, Rebecca told him about what she saw in the women's restroom. To hell with it all, he waved it off back then, angry and humiliated. Oh, how that girl caused a magnificent scandal. Recalling that scene now, the professor couldn't help but smile. He could see himself, a young man full of strength, standing in the narrow hospital corridor in his blue medical uniform with a white coat over it, surrounded by curious eyes, the harsh light of night lamps, and those desperate cries. Matthew, I'm pregnant. We're going to have a baby. Yes, was she really pregnant with his child? Rebecca had said so back then. How old would his son or daughter be now? But, well, all these are empty speculations. He never met Molly again, and he has no daughters or sons. Enough of reminiscing about various nonsense. It all remained in the past life. A few days later, a terrible incident occurred. Right before the professor's eyes, a shootout broke out in the university courtyard. Some psychopath brought weapons inside and began shooting indiscriminately. Matthew quickly assessed the situation, shouted for everyone to get down on the ground and cover their heads with their hands. He himself fell to the floor and dialed the police. Something whizzed past his ear. A sharp scream from behind made him raise his head and turn around. Not far from him, Leonid, shielding a girl with his body, had managed to get hit by a stray bullet. The police arrived quickly, apprehended the attacker, and the injured were transported to hospitals by emergency vehicles. Matthew rushed towards the stretcher on which Leonid was being carried. The same girl was crying next to him, her tears mixed with makeup smudging her cheeks. Professor, the young man wheezed, here's my phone. Can you call my mother? She doesn't speak Russian well. Please tell her where they're taking me. All right, all right. Matthew reassured the boy. Everything will be fine, you'll see. The wound is not deep, it's a flesh wound, I'm telling you as a surgeon. The main thing is not to lose too much blood. Hang in there, kid. Suddenly, he called the boy by that endearing, affectionate word for the first time. Glancing at the stretcher, he asked the medics which hospital they would take the injured to. Either St. Stephen's or the central one. Call, they will guide you, the focused individuals replied. 
Once again, pleased with the coordinated work of the local medical services, Matthew went to rest in the university cafe. But before that, he was examined by attentive rescuers, just like everyone else who was present at the scene. You have symptoms of shock, said a focused woman, a doctor. You need to go to the clinic. I'm a doctor myself, colleague, he smiled at her. I'm not in shock. Everything is fine. After drinking some warming sea buckthorn tea with a dash of bourbon, Matthew dialed the necessary number. Hello, good day, he struggled to find the right English words, speaking to the worried woman on the other end of the line. This is Professor Alexander Ignatovich from the University in St. Petersburg. We had an incident. Your son is currently in the hospital. No, no, there's no need to worry so much. He will be fine. Yes, he has a gunshot wound. I speak a little English, so he asked me to call you. Yes, of course, we'll take the first flight, the poor mother shouted. Palmer, can you hear me? Terrible news. Leonid is in the hospital. He was shot. Realizing that they wouldn't speak to him anymore, Matthew ended the call. His mission was accomplished. However, a day passed, then another, and the professor felt restless. After all, he and Leonid were almost friends. He needed to visit the boy in the hospital. Hello? In a clean hospital room, he found the smiling and recovering boy, as well as a middle-aged woman sitting next to him. Hello, almost mechanically, without even really looking at her, he greeted her in English, remembering that she didn't speak the language well. Good day, she joyfully replied. Thank you so much for calling me. I've been living abroad for so many years, but I never managed to learn the language. We have a large Anglo-American diaspora there, almost like home. She sighed and immediately realized her mistake. Oh, I didn't even ask you then, what is your name, she said. Mr. Ignatovich, the professor said habitually, slightly tilting his head and smiling, or Matthew if you prefer to use English. Nice to meet you, she said, looking more attentively at his face. I'm Mrs. Torres. Molly, he exclaimed. He approached her, the years taking their toll, and his vision sometimes failing. He looked at her more closely. Excuse me, have we met before? Matthew, is that really you? The woman whispered quietly, covering her mouth with her hand as if in shock. What's going on? Do you know each other? Leonid asked, looking at them from his bed. Do you speak English too? The professor asked him. Yes, my mom taught me, the boy replied. And what does she call you at home? Matthew curiously asked. Leo, Leonid shrugged. My name in English is Leo. Molly, he turned to her, almost pleadingly. Let's go to the cafe, professor. The boy needs to rest, Molly said cheerfully. But, mom, Leonid was surprised. The doctor said you need more rest, Molly said. So, rest and stay in bed. The hospital cafeteria was as lively as always. Relatives, doctors, and recovering patients consumed burgers, discussing their own matters, and no one paid any attention to the conversation between the two visitors at a small table in the far corner. Yes, he's your son, Molly sighed. There's no point in denying it. But you left me, remember? You left without a word to anyone. What was I supposed to do? I had to find a way to live my life. Yes, I understand, the professor calmly said. He no longer harbored any special feelings for this woman, but his son, that was a different matter. I want to be a part of his life, he told her. Please, don't stand in the way of that. I didn't plan to. It's a little strange, Molly said, frowning. What do you mean? Matthew asked. Well, I'm not quite sure how to handle this, she shook her head. I'll tell you now, and you can judge for yourself. She paused for a moment and then began to tell him the following story. Not long ago, Molly's elderly mother passed away, and she traveled back to her homeland to give her mother a proper burial. While going through her mother's belongings, she discovered information about a bank account in her name, with a considerable sum of money, along with a folded piece of yellowed paper. 
On it was a handwritten note left by her late mother. My dear daughter, your biological father never wanted to communicate with us, but he ensured that both you and I were well provided for. This bank account was opened in your name when you were just a child. Afterwards, on his advice, I closed the account to prevent the money from being lost. I bought gold, then foreign currency, and now I can depart this world with a clear conscience, having done everything I needed to for you and your son. Molly, your father is a respected and well-known figure in our town. He was the director of the cotton mill during my youth and is now a member of the city council, and perhaps soon he will become the governor. His name is Mr. Patterson. He had a family, a wife, and a daughter, your half-sister. Maybe someday you will meet her. It would be good for close relatives not to lose touch in life. Sending you kisses, my dear. Your mother. My mother wanted me to meet my half-sister, Molly smirked. Instead, I ended up meeting her husband. And my father. It's still hard to believe how he tried to intimidate me when he visited the clinic back then. That's how life unfolds, she smiled at him sadly. But when I named my son Leo, I didn't know any of this. Do you want to know why I named him that? Matthew simply shook his head in silence. Because you once told me that you and your wife had a little son named Leo. I decided to name our son the same way, just to spite you. I wanted him to grow up big and beautiful, just like you, so that one day you would feel unbearable pain when you saw him and realized what you had lost. Lost once again, Molly explained. You're a cruel woman, Molly, he said sadly. It was very painful for me many, many years ago, and I fled the town, trying to escape that unbearable pain. I understood that later, she replied to him. And I want to apologize to you for everything. Now that you've met Leo, you can make up for lost time, at least a little. You know, when he was little, I often thought of finding you, writing to you, letting you know about him. He looks so much like you. Did you notice? Of course, Matthew nodded. As soon as I saw him for the first time, something stirred inside me, memories came flooding back. The professor reached into his pocket and wiped his eyes with a handkerchief. I'm sorry. Well, let's go. Molly stood up decisively. Let's go and tell him everything. Matthew continued teaching at the university for another 12 years before retiring and quietly living in his house, on the outskirts of St. Petersburg. He got a dog and spent time with his grandchildren. Now he had two grandchildren. Leonid graduated from university, got married, and he and his wife had twin boys, two wonderful boys named Ruslan and Alexander. Matthew was very proud that one of them bore his name, albeit in a western manner. Grandpa, when we grow up, Ruslan and I will also become doctors like you and Dad, Alexander often said. First and foremost, be honest with yourself, my grandson, his grandpa would answer. And never hurt your loved ones. They became very close with Leonid, as loving father and son can be. Leonid's wife, Lucy, worked as a journalist and collaborated with a popular magazine. One day, she asked Matthew for permission to write a book about his life. He was surprised by such a proposal and initially wanted to refuse, but then changed his mind. Why not, after all? Perhaps this story would become a bestseller and bring prosperity to his family.